All right, so what we're going to do now is going to uh, start to talk about metabolism. And uh, this is fused with energy, um, energy transfer within cells. And uh, it starts off with a bunch of terminology and uh, how the energetics uh, works of chemical reactions. And then we fit in enzymes into it and see how enzymes are involved in the chemical reactions. And then we start to look at some specific chemical reactions. Uh, those would be the reactions of uh, glycolysis, pyruvate, oxidation, and the citric acid cycle. But this is kind of like the starting point. So in cells, <clears throat> what we have are uh, the chemical reactions that take place, starting off with some initial molecule. Okay, so we'll just call this a reactant molecule. And that reactant then is changed in some way. So there's change. And then we have a new molecule that is the product. So the reactant and then the product. And then so there could be multiple reactants. Uh, so this could be, you know, Z plus A um, equals B plus Y. So these could be two new, you know, these are no longer here. We have two new molecules as the products of, of the reactant. So those types of things can happen uh, just on their own within the cells. And if they do happen just on their own, they're called spontaneous reactions. So the emphasis here is that they can happen, not that they necessarily will happen. Um, reactions that can happen are going to have certain characteristics or properties. That's going to relate to energy. So here we have energy over here. This G uh, represents what we call Gibbs free energy. And we'll just use the, the, the A and the B in a here. And so let's say we have the uh, A molecule starting off up here. And here's its, its energy level on this Gibbs free energy uh, axis. And then the product over here, let's say B, uh, is down here. Okay, and so it has a much lower energy. So the energy level from A to where B is going to be at the end of the reaction, uh, B is a lot lower. Uh, our curve, well, right now I'll just draw it just coming down like this. You can see it's a, it's a downhill curve. So it's just kind of like if you had a, a ball at, up at the top of a hill, right? the ball could roll down the hill. And if it started rolling down the hill, it would continue to roll down the hill. So it's something that can happen. Will it happen? Will the ball just roll down the hill? Maybe and, and maybe not. There may be something stopping it from rolling. Uh, so there's a lot of things in, in real life that, that, that could be friction and a whole number of other sorts of things in its way that it would have to overcome before it would start moving downhill. So there's this little energy bump here which is now preventing it from moving. And this happens with a chemical reaction as well. Certain things are going to prevent those reactions sometimes from progressing forward. Uh, now, reactions that have a high energy to start with and a low energy at the end of the reaction, something has to happen to that energy. So there's something that we have to realize. energy cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed. So energy, this is as far as the most important thing here for talk discussion of cells and energetics, uh, changes form. transformed. So the energy here when we start off with molecule A being changed into molecule B, some energy has to be given off. There has to be energy released. Okay, so a release of energy. That's another characteristic of a spontaneous reaction. So spontane spontaneous reactions can happen. 
for spontaneous reactions, for, or for a reaction to be a spontaneous reaction, uh, the products, or sorry, the reactants have to have a higher energy level than the products. Reactants have higher energy than the products. And what that means, then, by definition, is that since energy can't be destroyed, energy will be released. It's released when and if that reaction actually occurs. So, for example, you have a match. It can burn, right? It may not burn, but it can burn, okay? It can burn, right? So, a match. It has potential energy. As a reactant, the chemicals on here and the wood have the potential to give off a lot of energy. But this match is not going to just burst into flames. The end result, the product of the reaction, would be the charred wood. Okay. But as long as we look at it and stare at it, it's not going to ignite. Right? It needs something to start the reaction. That's this little bump here. We call this activation energy. So the activation energy is required for the reaction to occur. It won't progress unless that energy can be supplied. Now the thing is, still from here, this level to this level, the change in free energy, what we call delta G, is going to be the same, regardless of whether that activation energy is very high or even higher, you know, or or low. Depending on what level it is, it really doesn't matter. Just that is going to affect how soon the reaction may occur. Is it going to occur right now, the second, or is it going to occur minutes from now? When is it going to happen? This energy is going to come mostly from the environment. So heat, essentially. And in this case, say, of a match, friction. So what will it take to get the match to, to burn, right? Friction. So I strike the match, some energy, but it didn't burn, OK? So I expended some activation energy, but nothing happened. I tried a little bit again, more energy. Now it's burning. So now at this point in time, there's energy being released. Energy is uh, being given off in the form of light, in the form of heat. And so this is the release of energy. So it not just keeps going. I don't have to add any energy to it. it is, it's sustaining itself. Okay, And it's constantly giving off until all that's left, except as the charred remains, it'll have very little potential energy at the end of the reaction. And in cells, many of the chemical reactions that happen in cells are going to happen the same sort of way, Okay, where they all require some little spark to get them going but once they get going, they'll proceed on their own and they'll give off energy in the process. Okay. So that's the idea here. Our, our delta G right, is a change in free energy. The change from the storage, high level of storage in the beginning and the sort of expended energy form at the end where some energy has been given off. So that's a spontaneous reaction. And this is what we call activation energy. All right, so that's the first, our first step. <clears throat> and that's related to what we said called the, the first law of thermodynamics. So the energy um, isn't created or destroyed. And that these two energies are also, you have to consider, separate from one another. So again, the activation energy is supplied from the environment. It's not supplied from this. So if this level, so sometimes in the future we'll give a level to this. So let's say this delta G value uh, was equal to negative 10. And that we, this would be in the form of kilocalories. Uh, we get something we can get into more so later. And that's the change, let's say, for example, in the free energy. Now, depending on the cost of the activation energy, it could be high, right? Or it could be low. But this is not going to change. 
It doesn't matter if this is high or low. It's always going to be a 10 kilocalorie change. So when I strike the match, right, if I have to strike it once and it ignites, or I have to strike it 10 times, that's not going to change the amount of light or heat that's given off by the match, right, the delta G. That's something up front that has to be invested, but it's not coming from the match itself. It's not coming from any of the stored energy in here. We're not losing any of that energy because we had to strike it. Right? That's something separate. So these are two separate energies. So that's, that's one of the first things are these terms that you can start to, um, to get. This graph is a graph that you're going to see. This is a graph that I'll come back to several times as we talk about enzymes and what enzymes do. And it's a graph you're going to have to be able to essentially sketch on your own, be able to label one that is already sketched for you to compare uh, energy levels within them. So just make sure you can label the axis of uh, the Gibbs free energy, the progress of the reaction, uh, a reactant and product a change, the activation energy hump, that sort of thing. So may make sure you can do, do those sorts of things. All right, so that's for a spontaneous reaction. Next, we're going to move on into... Um, what is to be a non-spontaneous reaction, and then we'll, we'll move forward from there.